think about everything that he's done, when I think about everything that he's allowed us to see, to do, to know, to experience, to hear, to live, I can say that even if I've got to say it in a whisper that I really love the Lord. And so today we are thankful. I'm certainly glad to see you guys again. It's been a while since I've seen you. And I'm certainly glad that I'm back here. Y'all, I changed, what happened was I changed my name so y'all didn't know that I was here last time so that y'all would invite me back again. So <laughs> joke's on you. <laughs> um, we're certainly glad to be here uh, once again with the Metro family and certainly thankful to God for the praise and the worship that has gone up this morning. I thank God for it. I needed it. Praise God. I need, somebody else needed it too, but I needed it. Oh, thank God. God, I believe, was exalted this morning. Um, and we're just glad that we get to be here together one with another. Um, and so as I express, to be completely honest, I'm thinking about this subject matter. I don't know why he asked me to speak on this subject. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. I feel like that to speak on the subject of adulting, you have to choose somebody who has successfully adulted for a while. <laughs> don't say right like <laughs> you ain't supposed to agree with me. <laughs> you know, just c call me back when I turn 30 and we're going to try this again. <laughs> so we're thankful to God prayerfully. We're going to get this thing, get through this thing together, y'all. Um, so if you would, please meet me in the book of 1 Samuel. To, to the sister in who were excited that we were coming from the book of Judges, I'm so sorry. Uh, we called an audible. <laughs> so we called an audible, and I texted your pastor, and I told him about the audible. I guess he didn't text it to y'all. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we'll be coming from this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 17. You, is that one good too? Is that one all right? Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 17. A familiar passage. Uh, we're going to begin reading at verse number 32 and terminate at verse number 40. Oh my goodness, these letters are small. Uh, this isn't my Bible. This is my wife's Bible. I'm okay. I'm going to get it. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 beginning with verse number 32. The Bible there reads, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine, too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. That's 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 through 40. If you would indulge me, we do this at home every week, but if you could just help me out for a second uh, and turn to your neighbor for a moment and say, neighbor, y'all can do so much better than that. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm glad to see you in the house of God. And neighbor, you may not be glad to see me, but I'm still glad to see you. So neighbor, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, you aren't going to stop my praise, and I'm not going to stop yours. Amen, amen, amen. If you would, go to God in a word of prayer with me. Our merciful Father in heaven, Lord, we realize that we wake up every day with Goliaths on our schedule. And Father, we're asking that you be with us, Father, because not only is this morning a tough one, but tomorrow might be too. And the day after and the day after. But you are faithful. And so, Lord, as we explore your word and as we examine it, we're asking that you open our hearts and our minds to the things you have to say to us, not the things we have to say to ourselves. 
Father, allow us to receive from your word so that we can leave this building better than when we came in it, not taking any moment for granted. Father, we're asking that you move in a mighty way. We're asking that you help us. We're asking that you keep us. We're asking that you be with us. We're asking that you lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all still with me? You guys okay? I'm just going to let you know we're going to do the same thing that we do. Oh, well, I'm going to let you know that we're going to do the same thing that we usually do when I'm at home. That's three things. I'm going to read the passage. I'm going to explain the passage. We're going to make application. And then I'm going to take my seat. Is that all right? Read the passage, explain the passage, and make the application. And then I'm going to take my seat. I'm not going to tell you how long it's going to take, but I'm going to tell you what, it's, what I'm going to do. Uh, just so that y'all can hold me accountable. Um, but I, I've got to say that in thinking about the subject and mulling over the idea of what, it's called, uh, what is called adulting, um, I've got to, I, I tried to reflect on every adult decision that I've made in my life. Um, and to be completely honest, the best thing I've ever done was marry a woman with good credit. Ain't God all right? Uh, it's called being resourceful. I learned that. It was in a business book somewhere, but yeah, praise God. And she's here with me this morning. So I thank God for my lovely wife. If you would raise your hand, Kristen, so much. Thank you so much. And I thank God for it. But uh, in, in, in thinking about it, to be completely honest with y'all, that was about the best I've, I've come up with. So uh, uh, as we try to figure this thing out together, I'm hoping that you can examine the experiences that you've had and really figure out if you're adulting or if you're just playing dress up. Uh, so today we're going to explore the perspective of David and figure out if we can line ourselves up with what the scriptures would be considering maturity and something that we all have to face in adulting. And so we're just going to stick with this text and we're going to go through the subject, hopefully understanding how it applies to us. We still good? Yes. Turn to your head to the left. Turn your head to the right. Shake your head a little bit. Okay, just making sure y'all awake. So as we go through this text, I want you to know um, that if we're to apply this, generally speaking, uh, what I like to refer to what Israel was going through at this time was what I call the Goliath effect. Uh, and I call it the Goliath effect because Goliath was somebody who had the entire nation of Israel petrified as they were supposed to be fighting the armies that were opposing God. But because they saw Goliath and they saw his stature and they knew of his experience, they pushed back and they didn't go against Goliath because they knew that everything that Goliath was and everything that Goliath was capable of. And so because of that, they became overwhelmed with the appearance and the stature of Goliath. They fought other armies before, but the reason why they wouldn't fight Goliath is because Goliath was a little bit bigger. Goliath was a little bit stronger. Goliath had a little bit more experience. And so even though this was not their first battle as a nation, they stayed away from Goliath because they were afraid that this battle may not go our way. And if you realize that if you kind of chase the idea of Israel being petrified or unwilling to move forward throughout Scripture, that this isn't the first time that Israel was refusing to go forward, nor was this the first time that Israel had to face a Goliath. Can we make Goliath a metaphor really quick? The people of God have always had to face Goliath from the very beginning of the Scripture. Adam and Eve had to face Goliath when they had to choose whether or not to eat of the tree of good and evil or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Adam had to face Goliath when he was told to sacrifice his son Isaac. Israel had to face Goliath when they were urged to leave Egypt out of the hand of Pharaoh. Moses had to face Goliath when he had to lead the people who were consistently rebelling against him. Israel had to face Goliath when under Joshua they moved into the promised land and there were nations who were bigger than they were and stronger than they were and they had to expel them from the promised land. Israel had to face Goliath and the people of God had always have to face Goliath from the very beginning up until this point. But this Goliath was a little bit different. This Goliath was different because when the army saw him and they refused to go forward, it was not only an acknowledgement of the strength of Goliath, but it was also a disrespect of the strength of God. Stick with me for just a second. Stick with me. Because when Goliath stands before people to terrify them, he simply overwhelmed them. And if we were to just simply examine or self-examine our own experiences, the hardest part about learning to grow is about persisting even when you're overwhelmed. Can we... It's not that life happened, it's that life happens a lot. Can we? Sometimes it's not that life happens, it's that life happens every day. Somebody said that the hardest thing about life isn't the fact that it happens, it's the fact that it happens over and over and over and over and over again. 
The fact that you woke up yesterday morning and conquered the day doesn't mean that you won't be terrified to wake up this morning. And when you're in the position of what we would call adults, and you know what, just thinking about it, the most terrifying experience in just learning how to grow up is when a little kid comes running up to you and they're lost. And they come to you because they're looking for an adult. And then you have to turn around and look for an adult yourself. (laughs) And then you realize you are the adult that they're looking for. That's terrifying. Because now you realize that life is about more than your own experience. And you realize that life is about more than what you can do for yourself, but really the fact that you have a responsibility to uphold the, 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 the weight of being a full-grown person. That's terrifying. Somebody, I don't like being called a full-grown person sometimes. You know, some, I used to think adulthood meant you can't take naps, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. My wife has proved to me that it does not mean that you do not have to, that you have to keep away from naps. She's, she's proved that to me. Uh, I'm sorry. Y'all just got to keep me, keep me. The clock at Northside is straight behind me. Y'all got it over there. So y'all just look at your clock or something when I'm going too long. But um, the truth of the matter is when we experience the, 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 the feeling of being overwhelmed, we often have an unhealthy response to being overwhelmed. And when we're overwhelmed, we choose to retreat most of the time. When we know that something is coming that we don't want to experience, that we don't want to face, that we don't know how to handle, that we don't know how to deal with, we begin to feel overwhelmed. And when there are too many factors at play, then we begin to retreat. And many of us have different responses to what it feels like to be overwhelmed. Some of us just revert to behaviors that we're used to. Some of us just revert to people that we're used to. Some of us revert to mindsets that we're used to. Because when we see that something that we have to face is overwhelming us, then we don't want to face it because we're afraid of what the outcome might be. We're afraid of actually stepping into it and realizing that this is my responsibility and this is something that I have to handle because if I have to handle this and it doesn't go well, I am terrified of the experience of failure because even though I failed before, I've never failed on this level. And even if I know what failure is like, if the giant gets bigger, then the failure in facing that giant will also grow. And so really, I experience being overwhelmed, and then I have unhealthy behaviors in response to my being overwhelmed. Y'all still with me? Y'all shake your head a little bit just to make sure you're still alive. So when we experience being overwhelmed, we all respond to it differently. And I need you to stick with me there for a second. Knowing that everybody has Goliath experiences, you look at whatever it is you're facing, You look at whatever it is you're dealing with. You look at whatever it is you're going through. You look at whatever life responsibility you have, and you realize, I'm not fully equipped (laughs) to take care of whatever it is I'm expected to take care of. But you know what sometimes I do? Sometimes I look at my mother, and I realize that she did a whole lot more with a whole lot less. Can we... Where I am right now is further than my mother has ever been. And I think about everything that she accomplished in raising her children, in handling and dealing with her life, in accomplishing things that I still seek to accomplish in relationships, in her level of spirituality, in her ability to forgive, and her ability to love unconditionally. And here I am worried about what tomorrow may bring when I look at somebody who had almost nothing, yet somehow made it into where she is. And so when I go home, I always remind her, Mom, you had three kids and you did a good job. Look at me. Ain't you all right? She doesn't know how to respond to that because she wants to say she did a good job, but she doesn't want to boost my ego, so I get a yes anyway. Uh, But when we talk about what we're actually afraid of, honestly, it's a deep fear of failing. Uh, We don't want to be left out to dry. And so what we honestly end up doing is we try to build our lives around having a safety net. We try to make sure that there is no possible way we can fail, no matter how hard we try, so that we spend all of our lives spinning in circles and trying to make sure that even if I fail, I'll be all right. And we never begin to advance beyond that point because we never know what enough is. We never know if I have enough money. We never know if I have enough friends. We never know if I have enough job security. We never know if we have enough because we're trying so hard not to fail that we've never progressed. And when you spend your life trying not to fail, you never succeed. Help me out for a second. 
because you don't know anything but protecting yourself and you don't know how to move beyond where you are. And so the trouble is when you face something that's insurmountable, you never end up moving forward. You just end up trying to build up your walls while never attacking. So here's where Israel was. Goliath was standing in their way. It was their responsibility to make sure that the Philistine army was annihilated. And so in Goliath standing in their way, this immature kid approaches the front lines trying to help out his brothers by bringing them food. And he says, who, who, who's, who's this that dares to defy the army of the Lord? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares to speak against the armies of God? And the other soldiers looking at him like, do you not see him? You stupid. He's nine feet tall. His armor weighs more than you weigh. And from their perspective, there was no logical reason that would say, I want to go against Goliath. If there was any incentive for fighting Goliath, King Saul gave that incentive. He literally said, if you beat Goliath, I will give you a tax-free life and a wife. Come on, somebody. I will give you a tax-free life and a wife. Some of us would have stepped out to the battlefield and said, I'll try. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen, but I try. If something happens, then God be the glory. But if you're going to take away my taxes and give me a woman, praise the Lord. But the incentive was there to beat Goliath. And so David is asking questions around the army saying, where's, where's the champ? Where's our soldier? Who's going to step up against him? He's defying the armies of God. And the first thing I need you to notice is when David steps on the field to defy Goliath, his perspective is completely different from every other soldier. He does not see the world the same way his brothers do. He does not see this war from the same angle that the rest of the soldiers do. The rest of the soldiers are looking at Goliath and they see his stature, they see his war history, they see his armor, they see everything that he comes with. And all David sees is who is this man who defies God? David was not concerned with anything about Goliath. Reason being is because David had a level of confidence in God that said it really doesn't matter who Goliath is because the fact of the matter is he's defying God. So you can add nine more feet to Goliath. It doesn't matter. You can add 125 more pounds to his armor because I don't even see his stature. The only thing I see is that he's speaking up against the God who has gotten us this far. And so when David steps out against Goliath, Saul tries to prepare him for battle. David convinces him. And he goes to Saul. Saul says, okay, go fight Goliath. But here's the part that I personally identify with. In order to fight Goliath, Saul gives David his armor. Why? It's logical. He's going into battle. You give the man your armor. He's going to fight somebody. So David tries on the armor. He takes a couple of steps. And he says, this, this doesn't work for me. He's literally choosing to go into battle without armor. This is completely illogical. Why would you choose to fight somebody without armor? David says, I'm not used to this. Here's the reason why it resonates with me. is because there's a big difference between adulting and playing dress up. Can we talk about this for a second? I remember when I was a kid. Y'all remember Brute the aftershave? Yeah, they still sell it. I realize that. Yeah, they still sell it. But um, when I was younger and, and, and my father was around in the house and I would go into their bathroom sometimes and their whole room, Brute is strong. If you never smelled Brute, just go into Target or Walmart one or two times and just open the bottle. You don't have to put it up to your nose or nothing. But Brute just filled the room. And so when I wanted to be like him, I'd put Brute, you know. I'd do it like him too. I'd kind of splash some on my hand and... Yeah, because I wanted to imitate him. And in wanting to imitate him, it made me feel like I was him. Or it made me confident enough to feel bigger than what I was. 
And so in thinking back to that experience and thinking into who I am now, I realize that playing the role of an adult does not equal actually being an adult. Can we? Just because I can talk does not mean I'm a good communicator. Just because I can pay a bill doesn't mean I can run a household. Just because I can organize my schedule does not mean I can manage my life. And so when I think about the details that are expected of an individual and turning into adult, often we have people who will advance through life without ever becoming adults. And can I give a shout out to millennials for a second? We have successfully advanced childhood until 18 and moved it on up to 36. <laughs> Cheers. Because we did what nobody else could do. Somehow we convinced y'all that we are good to stay in your house until we almost 40. And even though you may talk against us, I see that as a success. So you can keep it and you can keep us as well. I don't know who got the healthcare age moved up either, but praise God for you uh, because we did it. And somehow we even learned how to take the video games that y'all condemned us for and turn them into careers. Ain't God all right? <laughs> Not career playing the video game, making the video games. Please don't get the two confused. Please don't get the two confused. <laughs> but actually, that is very true because you can get paid actually playing games. I've, I, I tried. But um, when we talk about what it means to actually grow often, we set the wrong benchmark. And so we don't know what we're actually trying to grow into. And so we try to end up imitating our parents or imitating the generation before us when we really don't know what being an adult looks like. So David is in the situation when he's really not even old enough to be around because he's not just a brave soldier. He's not even a soldier. He's not just the best of the, of the, of the uh, Israel army. He's not even a part of the Israel army. So when he steps into the whole mix, David is stepping in there with absolutely nothing but confidence and the experience that he has in doing something that seems to be completely unrelated. Now, if there's something that I know that we can relate to each other on, especially when you're in the young adult category, it's that you spend your whole life trying to tailor your resume so it looks like you have relevant experience. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You have about 700 different resumes, and you have zero experience for any of them, but somehow you are a pro at every last resume, and so you try to send that in. So David steps in with this resume where he really has no relevant experience, and he's trying to apply for the role of defeating Goliath. And so everybody sees that David has no real experience. He's not a battle man. In fact, Saul uh, uh, embarrasses him, and he says, Goliath has been a, ch uh, a warrior since he was a youth, and you're still a youth. Goliath has been fighting since he was your size and your age, and you are just now getting to your size and your age, so you really don't have the credentials to step out there. But when God says you have the credentials, you have the credentials. And so David then gets into his comfort zone, and he says, I may not be a warrior, but I'm a shepherd. And even though you may see Goliath as a soldier, I see him as a lion or a bear. Y'all going to help me for just a second. Y'all see him because he can swing a sword. I see him because he's trying to attack my sheep. You see him because he can fight. I see him as trying to take over what God has already given us. And so when I go into this battle, I'm not going into this battle believing that he's going to outsword me or outsoldier me to death. I believe that I'm going to go into this battle believing that God is going to out God him. Because when I step into the fight, I'm not going with the confidence that we're going to go toe for toe on the swords. I believe that whatever God has planned, he's going to execute, even if it means I got to go in with my shepherd experience. So David steps to Saul and he says, when a lion or a bear stepped against my flock, I killed him. I clubbed him to death. I killed him with my bare hands. And so then after he defies Saul's armor... He then steps in to the stream or to the, br to the brook, and he grabs for himself five smooth stones. Y'all say, well, you guys remember this from Bible class, right? Just, just so we don't have to go reread it. He steps into the brook. He grabs stones. This wasn't, this wasn't a battle tactic. This was a herding tactic. David was stepping into this just with the experience that God has already given him. 
You say David doesn't know how to protect people. He knows how to protect sheep. You say David doesn't know how to fight an enemy soldier. David knows how to fight an enemy animal. And so when David steps in with the experience that he has, the reason why he advances beyond where he was is because when he approaches Goliath, his spirit is saying, whatever God has given me, I will use. And I believe that it's not my sufficiency that's going to give me victory. I believe it's the fact that God will make a way that's going to give me victory. And so I'm going to step out there. I'm going to try. I'm going to go for it. Why? Not because I have confidence in myself. I'm still a shepherd. I know that. I'm not trying to act like I'm a soldier. I'm still a shepherd. But I believe that my shepherding experience, given the ability to of God, can make this thing work out. And so one thing that we have to realize as individuals is that we don't always have the credentials that life requires of us, at least not from our perspective. We don't always have the resume that we would think we should have by this stage in life. But the truth of the matter is, when you realize that God is going to be with you every step of the way, then it changes the way you approach every single thing that you engage in. It changes the way you put, and I know that that seems, I, I, I really don't like that, just, just leaving it that, that God will be with you every step of the way, because often we use that, and we take that, and we use that as a justification for being irresponsible. Often we ask God to take care of our problems, because we don't want to be mature enough to handle stuff ourselves. Can we talk about this for a second? Often we ask God to take care of our issues, because we don't think that we can handle life. And it's not that we have the responsibility of replacing God, but you do have the responsibility of acting on a God like you believe that he can do something through you. And if you act like or if you pray to God as if he can do something, but if you don't behave as if he can do it, then you don't believe in your own prayer. And so, in fact, if I say, God, do this, it doesn't seem like I'm actually believing God. It seems like I'm asking God to do something that I really have no interest in accomplishing, so I want you to do it instead. And so if we're to take into consideration the power of God's ability to not only work, but to work in us, then it allows you to see that no matter what the outcome of this situation is, that God will always make a way through the situation, and that doesn't always look the way we expected it to look. But if we can be judgment day honest with ourselves, we are not David yet. Can we just, can, can I get to where I'm trying to go? Because I really don't preach unless I get to where we're ultimately trying to go. When we realize who's who in this story, before we can be David, you have to realize that you are not David. Stick with me. It's going to make sense. Stick with me. Because if we're to actually literally apply this to our lives, we're not David in this narrative. We're not David. We're not the ones going up against Goliath yet. That's not us yet. What we are at this stage in our lives is the Israelite army. That's where we are. We're trembling because life has thrown us a challenge that we're afraid to face. We're afraid because we don't know what tomorrow holds. So we stay on the battlefield wondering what tomorrow's going to bring. And so when we experience that, we end up spending our lives going in circles and going insane because we refuse to advance beyond where we are out of fear, out of terror, because we're petrified of what tomorrow holds. Let's be honest about it, because we don't like the prospect of not being in control. If I'm not the only one, then I'll be uh, I believe I'm, I may not be the only one not being in control of our own lives terrifies us. And because I cannot control the outcome of tomorrow, I would rather not wake up. Or I would do whatever I can to make sure that tomorrow doesn't happen. Not literally, but make sure that I don't have to step into the things that life is throwing at me just so that I don't have to face the, the reality that I'm not in control. But here's the thing. I'm so glad that there was a David before me. But I'm also glad that there was a David after David and before me. Can you help me for a second? Because while I was an Israelite trembling at what life presented, Jesus stepped up to my Goliath. Y'all going to help me for a second. 
Jesus divested himself or he removed himself of his heavenly vessels to be an earthly figure or a man like I am, to look like a servant, to step up and face the biggest challenge that my life could throw at me. And so when I was trembling on the sidelines, Jesus stepped up with five smooth stones. Y'all going to help me for just a second. Because when you learn that you are the trembling one on the sideline, you begin to appreciate that a humble servant out of Nazareth stepped into the place that you should have been in and conquered the battle that you could not conquer yourself. And so when Goliath was facing you, that's the Goliath of fear, the Goliath of pain, the Goliath of suffering, the Goliath of frustration and anger and terror, all the things that we are deathly afraid of. Jesus stepped up and said, who is this? That pushes against my people. Who is this that's trying to condemn them? Who is this that goes against everything that I stand for? So while we were trembling, Jesus was picking out stones. And while Jesus was picking out stones, we were still on the sideline wondering, how in the world is this Nazarene going to beat the biggest enemy that is death? Israel was expecting him to be a military leader. Y'all remember that? When Israel was expecting a Messiah, they were expecting a political ruler and king. Somebody who was going to literally overthrow the government and take over and restore Israel to prominence. And then here comes this homeless looking dude out of Galilee. Who didn't even have enough respect to be, to be honored in his own home. And he says, I'm going to beat your biggest enemy. And so then, when he steps up against Goliath, we see his arrest. And we see him mocked. And we see him ridiculed. And we see him beaten. Even before Jesus is crucified, he's facing the things that we refuse to face. Jesus is being ridiculed, and that's one thing that we are terrified of. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be ashamed. But before he even dies, he's facing the challenge that we refuse to face. And then as everybody's watching, he's crucified. And as he's crucified, this is the equivalent to David stepping out against Goliath because everybody before David even has a shot is saying this kid is dead. And so Jesus actually steps into the battlefield and he actually dies. But the irony is that when David stepped up against Goliath, he trusted that God would deliver him from that battle. When Jesus nailed to the cross, he knew that his father would raise him from the dead. And so then when we sung that song, that was the first time I heard that song, He Is Here. That's the first time I heard that's the first time I heard that. But when I heard that, what I was thinking of was what the disciples must have felt like on Sunday. Because first they got the news that he was risen. But then Jesus showed up. And I can imagine them saying, not only is he risen, but he's here. Because there's a difference between the intellectual comprehension of he's risen and the personal experience of he's here. Y'all going to help me. Because when I say he is risen, I'm just making an actual fact. But when I say, I'm, I'm speaking out of what I know. But when I say that he is here, I'm speaking out of what I'm going through. And so now when I say that he's here, I'm not just saying that because somebody told me. I'm saying that because I'm looking at him. I saw the victory with my own two eyes. I'm seeing him. I'm with him. I'm standing next to him. And so now at this stage in my life, I'm not praising myself because I understand that while I was trembling on the sidelines, just as Israel was trembling on the sidelines, just as the disciples were trembling on the sidelines, God was providing victories that I could not accomplish. But now that I know that the victory that needed to be accomplished has been secured, my only thing I can do is praise and testify because I know that whatever needs to be won, he's already done. The only thing that needs to be accomplished, he's already conquered. And so now I am celebrating him, and I'm not afraid to go into anything because I know that even if I try to create my own safety net, sometimes it rips. 
even if I try to do everything that I can to protect myself, sometimes it's not enough. And sometimes my experience of failure and frustration, now we can, 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 can we be honest about this? You will experience failure. <sighs> More than you're willing to accept. And it's going to be frustrating when you spend 15 years trying to avoid failure to go for it one day and fail on your first week. Because you realize that God is not trying to protect you from your losses. He's trying to show you how to learn from them. That God is not trying to keep you in a perfectly comfortable life. He's trying to show you what comfort looks like in every context. He's not trying to make sure that you are victorious on every level. He's trying to make sure that as long as your spirit is victorious, then you can see victory in everything. And learning that is one of the most difficult things in life. But you realize that when you learn how to be victorious in any situation, then you aren't worried about any losses or victories. In fact, you begin to confuse the two. Y'all going to help me for a second. Things that used to be losses aren't even considered losses in my mind anymore. Things that used to be victories aren't even a big deal anymore because now my perspective has changed. And since I've stepped up against a Goliath or two, I'm realizing that Goliath really doesn't have any power. The only thing I I can actually lose is my sight of the victory that's already been granted. And so no matter where I am, if I don't have sight of the victory, I've already lost. If I don't have sight of what God has accomplished, I've already lost. If I don't see very clearly that in every situation, in every circumstance, my ups, my downs, my highs, my lows, my Goliaths, that everything I do is mattered to show me that God has already won it for me, then I've missed it. Then I've missed it. And I'm not realizing in my own experience that he is preparing Goliath after Goliath. And you know what the scariest thing is? The Goliath that you're afraid of, there's a bigger one standing behind him. The Goliath that you refuse to face, the nine foot one, he's going to be 10 feet in a few years. And in a few years... That 10-foot Goliath is going to be 12 feet. But you know what's going to happen? By the time you're on your 100-foot Goliath, you're going to be laughing at the fact that you were afraid of the 9-foot one. Learning and figuring out that through all things, God is victorious changes the perspective of the way you approach those things. And the scary part about it is the only thing that was keeping Israel from victory was fear, not ability. God knew. See, the reason why we chose Judges chapter 7 is because that's the story of Gideon. Y'all remember the story of Gideon? And the reason why we were going to talk about the story of Gideon was because when Gideon was chosen to go up against the Midianites, he had chosen 32,000 men, and he ended up only going to battle with 300. And God told him that you have too many men when he had 32,000. That doesn't make sense if we're trying to win. If we're trying to win, I'm trying to get all the soldiers that I can. But God said to Gideon, if you go out there with 32,000 soldiers, they're going to end up believing that they won it by their own hand. They're going to end up believing that that 32,000 is what got them the victory. They're going to end up believing that we had a lot of soldiers and a lot of ability and a lot of power, and that's what gave us the victory. So we're going to shave this thing down to 10,000. Then we're going to shave this thing down to 300 so that when you go into the battle knowing that you are underarmed and underequipped and undermanned and you still win the battle, then you'll know that it wasn't you. You'll know that you didn't win this thing. you know that you were inadequate, and God is sometimes just trying to show you that he knows you're inadequate they know you're inadequate I know you're inadequate but when I'm there there is no inadequacy when I'm present there is no incapable when I'm present there is no loss when I'm there because I turn even the darkest days into victory and learning that is what God prepares us for and sometimes God is just trying to clear the stage so that he can perform. You're wondering, where's, where's my sunshine? God took it backstage. Where are my trees? God took them backstage. Where is my cast? 
God took him backstage. Where are my friends? Where are my family? God, all the things that I need to perform in life, you've taken away from me. Everything that I've asked you for and begged you for, I've been, I've been trying to get from you. You've taken away from me. And you've left me out here on this blank stage with nobody and nothing. Why are you taking everything from me? Because it is not your job to perform. It's your job to clear the stage so that God can demonstrate. <sighs> and perform himself. Your life is not your stage. Your life is not your stage. Your life is God's stage. The only thing God has you do, has you here doing is helping him clear it off. Because it's ultimately God's show. And when I see the doors close on my life, I pray to God that they're not throwing flowers at me. I just want you to see God do what he's doing. And I know that even though we all have different experiences, that it is terrifying. Can we not underestimate this? You know, ironically, uh, one of millennials' favorite thing to do is make fun of millennials. It's, it's hilarious. Like, I, I, honestly, I can't lie to you. I love, I, I love believing that, like, we're going to change the world while wearing yoga pants. It's funny. It's, there's, there's a lot of it. But there's just, there's so much, especially in the changing of generations, that we're trying to navigate and figure it out. But here's the God's honest truth. Figuring it out, especially from the perspective of a believer, isn't a matter of getting it. Because we often don't really figure it out until we can look and see it in retrospect. Because we often don't figure it out going forward. We figure it out looking backwards. And we see then what God was doing. Often we want the answers going forward. But usually the answers don't come until you look backwards. David defying Saul's armor is not a shouting point as it's happening. That is not exciting as it's going down. This kid is literally refusing armor to go into battle with an enemy nation. There is nothing exciting about that. I'm sure that by this time they were preparing for David's funeral services. But understand, the reason why we can celebrate it in retrospect is because God does things in places that we couldn't even perceive him doing them. God will make work happen that, that you couldn't have even figured out how it was going to happen. But the honest, the God's honest truth of this, and I'm closing, I'm, I'm, I'm closing. I see the clock. Goodness. Yeah. But the God's honest truth in trying to figure out how to live life is understanding that when you do have that perspective, that retrospect, that in and of itself is supposed to give you the confidence to go forward. Hear me, please. Not the answers going forward the confidence to go forward. The difference is you don't always have the answers going forward. But when you can see the work of God in retrospect, your testimony is he's done it before. I wish, I'm, I wish y'all folks had an organ in here because this is an organ moment. Mm. He's done it one time. I know he's done it before. When he's done it before, he'll do it again. It's why he always had to remind them, did I not bring you out of Egypt? Did I not conquer your enemy nations? Have I not been good to you up until now? Why wouldn't you step out into the place I'm calling you to? Because I know that you know that you don't need an answer for victory. You don't need reason for victory. You don't need logic for victory. You don't need the step-by-step -step and the play-by-play -play in order for me to win. I know how I'm going to win. The only thing I need you to do is step in and let the world know that I'm working through you. So the call to you is very simple. Understand first that there is a David between you and David. In fact, we call him the son of David the son of David and the seed of God. Reason being is because we don't just live 
trying to find victory. We live in light of an already won victory. And that's the victory that I've come to tell you about this morning. Because if you know that you've lived your life afraid of moving forward because you're afraid of your losses, then don't overwhelm yourself by worrying about how tomorrow's going to turn out. Don't overwhelm yourself by trying to figure out what tomorrow may bring. Because you know what the worst experience in the world is? Is you spend 10 years trying to plan tomorrow and tomorrow doesn't turn out how you planned it. <sighs> Bruh. <sighs> I tried to make everything go the way I anticipated it. And then it doesn't go the way I anticipated it. And I realized that I wasted my time anticipating it. Because tomorrow ain't going to wait for you. It's coming. And the truth of the matter is, Goliath is coming and is here. And no matter what it is that your Goliath looks like, understand that God has already given you enough victory to fight it. Y'all, I, I don't know if y'all like, because sometimes at home we don't, we don't like preaching as much as we like singing, so we got to give songs. If he hasn't done enough, I mean, if he doesn't do another thing, He's already, I figured y'all get it. <laughs> but understand that when you have that relationship with God, it's about what he's already done. That gives you the confidence to move forward. So sometimes you got to fall. That's all right. You can't believe that God picks you up if you never fall. You can't see God as a redeemer if you never see yourself in need of redemption. He can't be a healer if you don't acknowledge your cuss. He can't be a provider if you don't recognize your lack. And everything that God claims to be and promises to be, he shows himself to be when you allow him to be it. And so the call to you is to find the place where God won the greatest victory of all time. When he sent his son to be crucified on the cross of Calvary. To fight the biggest enemy that we have ever seen. That's life and that's death. And if that's your desire... To understand that God is your victor and that you can move forward knowing that he's won every battle that you need him to win. Then you need to return yourself to Jesus. Because in him we have life. In him we have love. In him we have every bit of confidence that we need to make sure that we will win. So the call to you is to find the, the cross of Christ. If you are not a child of God or if you don't have that relationship with him where you can say that Christ is my victory, then I invite you to the place where he hung, bled, suffered, died, and not only that, but he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. Because by doing that, not only did he demonstrate, but he actually conquered our biggest enemy, and that is death. Somebody says, well, I'm afraid to step out there because... I might die doing it. That's fine. Because you believe in a God who gives life. And when you believe in him, you trust in him. And when you trust in him, you live in faith. And that faith is what carries you through life. Because tomorrow doesn't have any guarantees that you know of. But I believe that God will. And when you believe that, it changes your soul. If that be your desire, if you desire to give your life to Christ, I'll ask you one question. That is, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? And you're answering yes, we will baptize you for the remission of your sins. I got to point back there because I'm used to pointing back here. We will baptize you for the remission of your sins. Baptism is not removal of filth from the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience towards God. And when your conscience towards God changes, so will your behavior. And if you are a child of God and you know that your life has been derailed, or you have been living in complete terror and you've been petrified for God only knows how long, then it's time for you to recognize that God is not ready for you, not, not, not preparing you to be confident in yourself. He's preparing you to be confident in him. Don't be afraid if he takes all your resources. He's the only resource you need. Don't be afraid of him taking away your safety net. He's the only safety net that you need. And as long as you're satisfied with God and God alone, that you're not afraid about what you'll lose in life. Because you know that you'll never lose God. But the reason why that's not really our reality is because we want more than God in life. Can we be honest about this? In many of our situations, God is not sufficient. 
Because when God isn't sufficient, we begin to talk to ourselves and to one another as if we need more than God. But God will demonstrate to you that the things that you rely on the most, I have the ability to take away from you. I will remove those things from you. I will make sure that you know what it feels like to need because the only thing that you really need is me. So the call to you is to find him again. And that place is at the cross of Christ. We don't move beyond the cross. We get there. We kneel down and we stay there and we don't get up and we grow in life from there. If that's your desire, we will pray for you. We will testify with you. Whatever it is you need, whatever it needs you need, respond to Christ Jesus. God bless you. Oh.